Well, let me uh, say it is a pleasure to be here. Um, and what I'm going to try to discuss is uh, both uh, the lessons of the North Atlantic crisis uh, for economic theory and, and for economic policy. And what I w want to emphasize is, uh, as several other people have pointed out, this is not the first crisis, so we don't have just one data point to talk about this. Uh, we have a wealth of experience uh, over the last 30 years, about over 100 crises. Fortunately, as a result of po some of the policies of, de of liberalization, uh, we have a lot more data set for us to understand what's going on. And if you look over a 150-year period, we have an even richer data set. And one of the remarkable aspects of this, maybe to uh, follow out on the question, is how could we have ignored that long history and had the hubris to think that we had solved the problem of the business cycle and that, we, that those issues were, were a thing of the past? So I'm going to try to summarize this in a, in a few general propositions. I'll talk a, a little bit more abstractly than some of the uh, previous speaker, speakers, but I'll try to re, re, relate it to some specific issues. The big lesson, I think, that we knew before and we should have uh, and was brought home very forcefully by the crisis is that economies are not necessarily stable nor self-correcting. Um, and uh, there are two parts of that that I want to emphasize. Much of the standard models focused on exogenous shocks. And uh, it's very clear that a very large fraction of the perturbations to our economy are endogenous. Uh, they are uh, uh, not only short-run uh, endogenous shocks, there are long-run structural transformations, there are persistent shocks, um, so that uh, the models that focused on exogenous shocks, I think, just mis misled us. Uh, the majority of the really big shocks come from within the economy. The second thing I said is that it's not self-correcting. And here, I guess, I, I uh, have to disagree a little bit with uh, George's view on how well we've done. Uh, I view uh, what has happened uh, in the United States and in Europe is a massive failure. Uh, there ha the loss in GDP between uh, our potential and our actual output is in the trillions, trillions of dollars. Now, yes, it could have been done worse. I agree with you on that. <laughs> we could have clearly messed up greater. And given the people who created the crisis in the first place were put in charge of fixing it, it's a little surprised that they did so well. So in that sense, I think it is, it is a, 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 an achievement that you call the same plumber and he didn't make exactly the same mistake. But at the same time, I, I think we have to understand that uh, our human resources, our capital stock, our natural resources today are the same as they were before the crisis. And the fact that we are in many countries, still not back to GDP the way it was before the crisis, and clearly in almost all of the North Atlantic countries, we're not back up anywhere near where our growth path would have had it, makes it clear that in a fundamental sense, uh, we have failed, and um, you know, the cat is still up I in that tree, and there's no good economic theory that explains why that is the case, and that is, in a sense, uh, a failure of our, of our models. Now, some of this has to do with uh, uh, the issue of uh, the slow pace of deleveraging, but the fact that things have often gone bad when we've had a financial crisis doesn't ex mean that they have to, that we could have done other things that would have done better. I actually think that this is more than just a balance sheet crisis. I think it, it, it can explain part of what has gone on. But there's also a structural transformation, all the problems of, of the manufacturing crisis, the rebalancing of the global economy, the um, changing comparative advantages that are going to require massive changes in the structure of the North Atlantic countries, uh, which have not adequately been addressed, all suggest that it's more than just a balance sheet uh, recession. That brings me to the second broad point. Uh, we know that markets by themselves in general do not lead to 
efficient outcomes, stable outcomes. And that means we have to think a little bit more deeply about what kind of economic architectures will lead to growth, real stability, and a good distribution of income. And much of the discussion was really, in one way or another, uh, a, a discussion of trying to think about tinkering or maybe making more fundamental changes in the economic uh, architecture. But there is an important distinction that I think perhaps has not been made as strongly as it should. There are some reforms that may enable the economy better able to absorb small shocks, but actually make it less able to absorb big shocks. And that's arguably true about a lot of the financial sector integration that allowed the economy to absorb some of the smaller shocks, but clearly exposed the co made the economy in some more, uh, sense uh, uh, less resilient, less uh, uh, sensitive to, to, fa to fatter tail uh, uh, shocks. And let me just mention uh, three, four uh, examples of issues that have been talked about, some of I, I think need further work on, uh, and some have already be, m been mentioned in, you might say, the ar architecture that will lead to greater stability. One is, I think there needs to be a lot more attention to automatic stabilizers and destabilizers. And there are lots of reforms, not only in the financial sector, but throughout the economy. The movement from defined benefit to defined contribution systems may have led to a less stable economy. A second one, we've talked a lot about too big to fail uh, banks, but we haven't actually talked about the problem of too correlated to fail. And the importance of getting, uh, a, a, you might say, a more diversified ecology of financial institutions that would lead to greater stability. We haven't looked at the economic system, the financial system, from you might call a, a, a point of view of, of, uh, of the total ecology of these institutions. And um, uh, that, I think, is, is something that we need to think about more. Thirdly, we haven't thought about as much as we should have of the extent to which decisions that we make uh, expose countries to more risk. And that's where the discussion in the last session, I think, was very good. Capital account management is, can be thought of as affecting the exposure to con of countries to various kinds of risk. Financial market liberalization is another example where we ought to think about that uh, more. And finally, uh, as a fourth example, I think the discussion of the fundamental uh, of, of, of capital requirements and the benefits versus the cost, once we take into account the Modiani-Miller theorem and the insights that that provides in uh, higher, requiring much higher capital requirements. The third point I want to make uh, deals with a more fundamental issue that has come out a number of times, but I want to highlight, which is the fundamental role Oh, in the financial at the center of the financial sector is credit and the provision of credit, credit institutions. And in a way, this is a very big change from talking about money to talking about credit. Now, in a balance sheet, and normally they're both two sides of the balance sheet, and those are going to be very highly correlated. But particularly in the context of economic perturbations, the two are not necessarily highly correlated. And we ought to be focusing on credit. And uh, I, again, I think it's remarkable to the extent to which uh, uh, there has been uh, inadequate uh, examinations in standard macro mo models of, of uh, the nature of this credit mechanism. But it's not just credit. Let me just try to highlight that. It's not just credit. It's an understanding of different kinds of finance, a major I area in, in um, uh, uh, the analysis of risk in, in, in financial markets is the differences between debt and equity. And yet, in standard macroeconomics, we haven't focused on that. And I'm pleased that some of the discussion today has tried to bring out uh, that that distinction. I think also it was good in this discussion to bring out the fact that uh, we are not in a corn economy where banks serve as an intermediary between farmers who have excess seed and farmers who want more seed. Uh, we are in a, a model, an economy where banks actually create credit. 
and uh, that uh, uh, that makes again a very big difference. Uh, one of the issues that's arisen a number of times in a variety of ways is distribution matters. Uh, distribution among individuals, distribution between households and firms, distribution among different firms, distribution among different households. Why is that important? Because traditionally macroeconomics focused on certain aggregates, average le uh, re ratio of leverage uh, to GDP or average numbers. That really doesn't give you a picture of the vulnerability of the economy. It wasn't, if we were talking about the average, uh, we would not have had a crisis if everybody was exactly the same. It was the fact that a large number of people at the bottom couldn't make their debt payments. And that, uh, uh, so that, that we really need in our models, even in macroeconomics, to try to incorporate uh, a, a greater understanding of, of, of the distributions. Well, let me now just talk about some, a couple very quickly um, broader issues. First, once when we go into an analysis of, of uh, credit, we become aware that we need to use multiple instruments and we want to uh, uh, use all of them, uh, all the instruments at, at our disposal. Where there's been a division between uh, 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 macro prudential, micro prudential, and conventional monetary policy instruments. But one of the things that uh, some of the uh, work that I did with Bruce Greenwald in our book, uh, Towards a New Paradigm, where we focused on the role of credit in the financial system and, the, and monetary policy, we argued that this distinction between these prudential instruments and mac monetary, conventional monetary instruments was a little bit artificial that if you could have coordinated instrument uh, use of all of them, they all affect the flow of credit, but they also affect the stability of the financial system, and that you want to use all of them uh, together. Um, and that is related to the broader issue that was raised a number of times uh, yesterday, uh, the critique of the old Timbergen idea that you want to have an assignment of one instrument to each institution, and that may have certain advantages from an agency point perspective, bureaucratic perspective, but from the point of view of uh, managing macroeconomic policy, focusing on growth, stability, distribution, uh, in a world of uncertainty, with instrument uncertainty, uncertainty about the state of the world, it makes no sense. You really need to have coordination among all the issues, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and among all the instruments that are at your disposal. The Nash equilibrium that would arise out of having different people control different instruments is in general not anywhere near what uh, is optimal in achieving the uh, overall social objectives. By the same token, if we raise the level of analysis of thinking about the distinction, the issue that was been raised both yesterday and today about prices versus quantities. Um, that's an issue that's been discussed uh, extensively in, in, in a variety of areas of economic literature. First, uh, we should recognize that in a wide variety of cases, we have nonlinear price mechanisms in which prices and quantities are limiting cases and that actually we often do use nonlinear price mechanisms. That is to say, we have minimums, we have maximums, we have uh, charges if you're b between the minimum and the maximum. And so I don't think that we want to try to polarize into prices versus quantities. And secondly, I just want to reiterate the point since the work of Weixman and, and well be even before that, um, that there are these uncertainties, both of instrument uncertainty and and uh, 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 the value, uh, the the the, the uh, uh, structure of the economy, so that it isn't as apparent as it would be in some simplistic models that that a price mechanism is necessarily uh, better. Finally, uh, in this area, there's a tendency to try to say, well one intervention is better than many. 
Uh, let's just focus on the interest rate or the short-term interest rate. Again, since the work of Ramsey 70, 80 years ago, we know that, that focusing on a single instrument is not in general the best way. We know that the reason we have monetary policy in the first place, the reason why government acts to intervene in the economy is that we don't believe that markets on their own will set the right short-term interest rate. If we did, we just would we'd just let free markets determine the short-term interest rate. So we all, almost everybody, certainly most central bankers, believe in the principle that you ought to intervene in the determination of one price. But what's the theory that says if you're intervening in one price, you shouldn't intervene in more than one price? And we know in, from the general theory of taxation and general theory of market intervention that that is not optimal. Well, finally, uh, let me just say that all of these are, that, that the general context that we are talking about all of these problems are situations where, as I said before, markets on their own are not efficient. And we can't obviously intervene and correct every market failure. But what we're talking here about here are some very large market failures. They're macroeconomic failures. You know, in, in, in a paper that Bruce Greenwood and I wrote a lot, number of years ago, we pointed out that whenever information is imperfect, whenever there are asymmetries of information, whenever risk markets are imperfect, conditions which are always satisfied, markets are never Pareto efficient. They're never constrained Pareto efficient. But what we're talking about here are some really big market failures, big macroeconomic externalities. And part of our, our, our policy analysis is to try to identify what are the biggest of these big market failures and how do we intervene to make the economy more stable, grow faster, and a better distribution of income. And I guess uh, the, uh, you might say first steps, I do think we're still at the first steps of trying to understand how we can do that. And part of that first step is to realize, as I think we've begun to realize, that markets on their own aren't going to solve these problems. And a single intervention, short-term interest rate itself, is not going to be able to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you.